Hi, I'm Paul Fotenauer and welcome to Frontiers, where we showcase UC Davis research that helps us understand and live in a changing world. Since ancient times, people have been enjoying both beer and wine and proclaiming their usefulness for curing a multitude of ailments. In recent years, researchers are learning that there just might be sound science behind what was once thought to be mere folk medicine. Our guests today on Frontiers are two UC Davis experts in the science of winemaking and brewing who have studied the potential health benefits of wine and beer. Charlie Bamforth is the Anheuser-Busch Professor of Malting and Brewing Sciences and Chair of UC Davis's Food Science and Technology Department. He is the author of several books on brewing and malting science, and he has studied the nutritional merits of beer. Professor Andy Waterhouse holds the Johnny e. Kinsella Endowed Chair in Food, Nutrition, and Health. He is a wine chemist and chair of the UC Davis's Viticulture and Enology Department. His research focuses on the chemicals that affect the taste of wine and those that relate to the health effects of wine for consumers. They have joined us today to explain how beer and wine might justifiably be considered part of a healthy diet. Gentlemen, welcome to Frontiers. Thank you. Professor Bamford, first question. It seems that beer and ale have been considered blue-collar beverages, and wine is a more sophisticated drink. Is that a fair characterization? I think they would take issue with that in some parts of the world. If you go to a country like Belgium or the Czech Republic, beer is held in, in true reverence and uh, is really uh, second to none in terms of alcoholic beverages. In a country like the United States, I think possibly the, you may interpret it that way, and I think it's the way in which beer perhaps has been presented. Um, it's always been the uh, perhaps more economically priced, and uh, uh, and therefore for that reason perhaps uh, uh, appeals and has always attracted uh, more people. It also is a drink for probably more drinking occasions, uh, and so it uh, it does appeal to uh, to uh, many more. Uh, stages in which you would want to, to perhaps take a drink. If you go back thousands of years, uh, perhaps uh, in the days of uh, ancient Rome where the, uh, the grapes uh, were, were sweeter and of course the grain derived drinks were less sweet, perhaps it was easier to drink the wine than it was uh, the beer in those dark, uh, far off days. Now Professor Waterhouse, we've heard a lot about the health benefits of both beer and wine. Now how did your laboratory go about uh, looking at the potential health benefits? of wine? Well, it started when I first got here in 1991. <clears throat> the dean of the College of Agriculture, John Kinsella, was actually doing a research project with some other faculty in the food science department. And they published a paper where they claimed to show the answer to the French paradox. They showed that wine contained an antioxidant, uh, the polyphenols, and heart disease is known to be caused by oxidation in the arteries. So they created a hypothesis that was very powerful and really launched the whole sort of enterprise of studying the wine and health, uh, the whole enterprise of studying wine and health. So what compounds were the focus of your research and then what did you discover? Well initially there was a report very shortly after that that showed that wine contained resveratrol. And resveratrol is found in some herbal medicines where they're actually prescribed for heart disease. So there was a lot of interest in resveratrol from day one, and we actually got involved with that and did some analysis of resveratrol in wine. What we found, though, was that the level in wine was very low and probably couldn't explain the whole French paradox. So we started looking at other compounds and did a lot of research on what's called catechin. Uh, it's another phenol. It's uh, called a flavonoid. Uh, you may have heard the term flavonoid. And we actually showed that when drinkers consume wine, the catechin shows up in their blood. So, so how do antioxidants uh, affect a person's risk of developing, say, heart disease? Well, the early theory was that by simply blocking oxidation in the bloodstream, you arrest the formation of plaque in the arteries. Um, I think nowadays we understand it's much more sophisticated than that, and it's not you don't just consume antioxidants and they stop oxidation in the blood. There's a, there's a much more complicated process that involves inflammation and blocking inflammation. What about other risks like cancer? Well, the cancer story is a little bit ambiguous right now. There's a lot of interest in this and there's a lot of research looking at flavonoids and cancer. But if you look at the food consumption data, 
Um, I think listeners might be very surprised to hear that there's some people in the research community saying there aren't really good links between diet and cancer, at least for all cancers. For some cancers, definitely. But for all cancer, uh, the, the evidence is a bit weak. Well, Charlie, let's talk about what research has shown uh, about beer's potential for lowering the risk of, uh, say, heart disease. Well, there have been many studies worldwide of the, the relationship between drinking alcohol beverages, alcoholic beverages generally, and the risk of, uh, of heart disease. And there are so many studies now that have shown that the effects are, are just as real for beer as they are for wine. And there is now a really strong body of evidence that uh, although polyphenols uh, have a, a role to play. It's probably the alcohol itself which is, is one of the key ingredients. There was a very famous study you reported in the British Medical Journal a number of years ago which said that really no difference between uh, wine and beer when consumed in the equivalent quantities. Um, so beer also has, uh, has polyphenolic materials. Andy's mentioned things like catechin. It's present in beer as well. Um, and, and some others as well. And there have been studies showing that uh, for one particular antioxidant, it gets into the, uh, the body more efficiently from beer than it does from a tomato. If I went down to the local farmer's market and said, here's a beer and here's a tomato, which is healthier, uh, most people would say it's the tomato. But actually, for at least this particular antioxidant, it would, it would actually be the beer. Is that because it's a liquid? Uh, the, the matrix does help. The matrix does help, and, and whether the, uh, it's taken in the form of liquid. And of course, uh, we, we believe that the presence of alcohol in, in alcoholic beverages also impacts the ability of, of various things to get into, into the body. So I think the evidence really is that uh, uh, when you consider atherosclerosis, that, uh, that beer, wine, they're probably as effective as one another. When it comes to, to wine... Oh, wait, I want to... Sure. So just make one comment. I think there are also quite a few studies that actually show discrimination between the beverages. Uh, quite a few very good ones, in fact, based on epidemiology. These are not clinical studies. And quite a few of them do show more benefit for wine than for beer. Now, not all of them, but there are quite a few. So I take a little bit of issue with the fact that all the beverages are completely equivalent. Well, equally, uh, you know, studies that have uh, done, and it's remarkable, uh, studies that are done in beer drinking countries actually uh, reveal the benefit of beer. Those that are done overtly in a wine drinking country is su surprising that they actually show a benefit for wine. So are you saying that science is biased? No, I'm not saying that science is biased, but I, I'm talking about the populations involved. You know, in a beer drinking country, such as Belgium or the Czech Republic or Germany, um, more people, they drink larger quantities of beer. And the, the studies, the analysis of, uh, of these uh, investigations, uh, obviously is going to feature more beer drinkers. And what a surprise, they actually uh, are, uh, are healthy because they drink beer in moderation. So if, if I go out to dinner tonight with my wife, do I order a glass of beer or do I have a glass of wine? Which do you prefer? You have what you enjoy, um, as long as you do it in moderation, of course. But uh, it, it, I would say uh, that uh, beer probably complements more foodstuffs than does wine. And therefore, I, I personally would vote for beer. But then again, I would, wouldn't I? Well, I would, I would second Charlie's comment. I think you should drink uh, whatever alcoholic beverage you prefer to drink with a meal. Um, I, I, I actually think that wine complements food a little bit better. The acidity, astringency, especially with uh, a nice steak, for instance, uh, really um, matches well. Um, the other thing is uh, I think wine, because wine is sour and astringent, and that's, some people don't like that, um, that that uh, those that taste actually controls your intake, so it's it's really not pleasant to drink <coughs> to drink wine in large quantities because of this taste. So, from a health benefit, though, which drink is better? Well, um, as I say, I, um, my interpretation of, of what's gone on worldwide is that uh, if you look at the the classic U or J shaped curve, the risk of death versus uh, moderate alcohol intake, uh, that the, the results for wine and beer are very similar. I would uh, suggest that uh, beer is the drink of moderation. One of the reasons is it's actually in defined units. Um, you know, you, uh, you have, a, have a, tw a, a can or a bottle, a 12 ounce serving or a pint, whereas uh, with other drinks, uh, it depends on the heaviness of your pour. So you, you can control your, uh, you understand your beer intake rather better. In terms of the other composition, um, beer has actually got quite a lot of uh, uh, nutrients in there. You know, there's this myth that it's empty calories. That is just so much garbage. Uh, beer contains uh, significant levels of B vitamins. Uh, it contains some of these antioxidants, as I've mentioned. It contains, uh, it's a very rich source of silicon. 
Uh, it's one of the richest sources of silicon in the diet. So I would say that beer is, uh, is uh, rather better. Andy, I would think you don't agree. <laughs> I think there's, you know, beer contains a lot of silicon. That's great. Um, but, you know, I think the, the data is very clear that wine consumers benefit from the health effect of drinking wine. I think, I, and I think I go back to the, the first answer, which is I think it's most important is moderate intake, regular intake. That's where you get the real benefit. It's not by drinking a lot on the weekends. And whatever beverage you prefer to drink in that way is going to provide you with the most health benefit. It, it seems that red wine may be healthier than white wine. If that's true, why? Well, in fact, the data on this is a bit weak. Um, but if there is an explanation, it really goes back to these polyphenols. Uh, there's much more of that in red wine, about 10 times as much. So these are the antioxidants I was talking about earlier. Uh, and then when, so when you consume that wine, you get more of that in the bloodstream, and that's supposed to be the, the, the cause of reducing heart disease. But the, the difficulty is in, in getting sort of clean data from epidemiological studies. That's where we gather data on existing populations. You know, what you really need is you need two villages in France, side by side, which have completely identical diets. And in one town, they drink nothing but beer. And the other town, they drink nothing but white wine. And in the third town, they drink nothing but red wine. And then we'd have the answer. Yeah. It, it, it really is difficult because there are so many confounding factors. You've got to take into consideration people's lifestyle. There was a very interesting study recently in Denmark where they actually looked at uh, the, uh, the uh, checkout um, um, printouts in a supermarket and they were comparing people who were buying wine and people who were buying beer. The people who were buying wine were buying lettuce and uh, low-fat yogurt. The people who were buying beer were buying sausages and meat and probably cigarettes as well. So, you know, it's, it's part of the whole lifestyle thing as well. Y you talked a little bit earlier about moderation. Is that important with regard to uh, the health benefits? If you drink too much wine, the, the benefits of it go the other way and, and, and beer? That's critical. Yes, definitely. Uh, any, there have been a number of studies now that have looked at what are called consumption patterns. And if you drink your seven drinks during the seven days of a week, you gain great benefit. And if you drink them all on Friday night, uh, it's, it, it, it actually is a big health risk. So it, it's very important. Absolutely, and the, the frequency is, has been highlighted, but you know, frequency and mo moderation, so no more than one or two drinks per day, but, but, but seven days a week, and certainly not accumulating it. That's, that's binge drinking, and binge drinking is a serious problem. We have 30 seconds left. I'd like to ask you one more question. That is, how long will it take before we resolve this issue as to what's better, beer or wine? Well, I think the, the difficult thing is the, the real answer is going to come from a controlled clinical study where we give people beer or wine, what have you. And I think that's going to be very difficult to do in a controlled, double-blind situation. And, you know, it's going to have to be long-term, so it, it's going to be very hard to get there. And you can't control all the other things people do with their lives. Virtually impossible to do it. Well, gentlemen, thank you both for appearing on Frontiers. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who joined us for today's discussion. You can learn more about this subject by visiting our website at frontiers.ucdavis.edu.